Welcome, friends. Thanks for joining us again for online worship here from Community Presbyterian Church in Brigham City, Utah. We're just delighted that you've joined us, and we invite you to settle in, get comfortable, and uh, enjoy a time of worship and praise today. As we begin, just a few announcements. Uh, here in Utah, the COVID vaccinations have been opened up beginning next week for ages 16 and above. And we encourage you to sign up, get your vaccination. The quicker all of us are vaccinated, the quicker we'll be able to uh, have worship together in our sanctuary that feels somewhat normal. Uh, if you need some help getting signed up, if uh, you're having difficulty um, navigating that whole system, call us at the office and we will get you some assistance with that. Palm Sunday, next Sunday, our worship will be online. And then Maundy Thursday at seven in the evening, we will have in-person worship in our sanctuary. It'll be a shorter than usual service. It'll be about 30 to 45 minutes. And we invite you to come, be masked up, and uh, we'll socially distance here inside the sanctuary. 7 p.m. Maundy Thursday. Easter Sunday, we will worship together in the parking lot at 10.30 in the morning. That as well will be slightly shorter service than is typical for a Sunday morning worship, but um, we invite you to join us for that. Bring a lawn chair. We hope we have great weather. Uh, bring a lawn chair to sit on, and if your children or grandchildren will be attending with you, please let me know or else call or text Chris Barker and let her know so that we can get a count on how many kids we have. We've got a special surprise for them, and we need to make sure we have enough of those prepared. And now, friends, let's prepare our hearts to come before the Lord. Let's pray. God of mercy and grace, there is not a moment of our lives that you are not with us. There is not a place we can go where you do not surround us. And so we come here today absolutely confident that you are present that your spirit fills this place, fills our hearts, fills this moment. So we ask that through the gift of your spirit, you would open us to your wisdom today. May we hear your word, may we drink it to the very depths of our souls, and may we be made both wise and faithful that we might follow you our whole lives. We ask it in the name of and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
invite you now to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, God of wisdom and grace, we come before you today opening our very souls to you. We recognize, Lord, that this is a mixture of this life is a mixture of joy and struggle, a mixture of guilt and innocence, a mixture of pleasure and pain. Merciful God, this week has been no different. As we have watched the headlines and listened to the news on the radio, merciful God, we admit that we are ashamed of how, of how we function in this world. We, we find no sense, Lord God, no, no sense of propriety or joy, but only shame as we look at the events that occurred in Atlanta this week at the senseless killings that seem to be motivated by racial hatred. Lord, that is the worst of us showing on display for the whole world to see. And at the same time, gracious God, we are, our hearts are lightened. We are sensing joy and relief and hope knowing that the vaccine rollout is achieving some great success. The numbers of folks who are suffering with hospitalizations due to COVID are down, deaths due to COVID are down. Lord, we're so grateful for that. We thank you for the tireless efforts of medical personnel and researchers, doctors, nurses, everyone who has been working in hospitals and clinics and research centers all around our nation, indeed around the world, working, putting themselves at risk to keep us safe and well. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to strengthen them. And we pray as well Gracious God, that you will strengthen our nation. We seem to be at odds with one another. We seem to have settled into a pattern of disagreement and argument and trying to pick and poke and prod and find fault with those who are different from us by reason of their uh, political ideas, by reason of the color of their skin, by reason of differences of age or circumstance or where we live. Lord, our God, we pray that you would cleanse us. We know that it's your plan that we would live at peace with one another, that we would walk with your justice. And so we pray, gracious God, that you would remove from us any feelings, ideas, thoughts, any convictions that we hold that don't reflect the mission the purpose, the love, and the grace of our Lord Jesus. Make us, push us, pull us, drag us into obedience, holy God, so that the words we speak and the work we do might show to the world, not us, but the face of Christ and the purpose of Christ. Lord our God, we lift to you all those who 
have been elected into positions of leadership in our nation, in our state, in our community. This is a stressful time and we pray that you would grant them some relief. We pray, gracious God, that you would make them instruments of your peace, that they would do your work. Holy God, you claim us as your own. And often when we think about that, we, we think of how lovely it is that you accept us and love us despite our many failings. But remind us that you claiming us as your own means that we belong to you, which means that we need to somehow match our purpose with your purpose. So Holy Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our soul, that we might begin to see others with the eyes of Christ. Help us, merciful God, to look upon each other with compassion, with grace, not with mere tolerance, but with great appreciation for the differences that exist between us and among us. Remind us that those differences create a beautiful montage. Gracious God, you call us to be and to become servants of Jesus Christ. So we pray that you'd give us not only his eyes to see, but his ears to hear, and his heart to love deeply with great compassion. Make us new. We don't want to be the same, same old person we used to be. Teach us, guide us, lead us, expand our hearts, we pray. All this we ask in the name of the one you sent to bring us to yourself. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this day comes from the New Testament book of the Hebrews. We'll be reading beginning in chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 5, verse 10. Hear the word of God for us this day. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and with tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who trust in him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of God for us. Thanks be to God.
most biblical scholars agree that the format and the purpose of the New Testament book of Hebrews is to serve as a type of sermon for encouragement. Perhaps our best clue for this is that the writer actually refers to the book as a word of exhortation in chapter 13, verse 22. Now, when we know this, it helps us to understand more clearly what the writer is trying to accomplish, that he's trying to persuade or encourage the audience to keep faithfully trusting in Jesus, even in the middle of challenging times. The writer reminds the Hebrews of Christ's faithfulness to God, and he holds up Christ's prayerful obedience as a powerful example that the people should try to emulate. What we come to understand then is that we, the listening audience, should also make it our goal in this life to continually become more and more like Christ. Even when we face struggles and challenges that this life will undoubtedly throw at us, it should be our goal, our purpose, to remain faithful. And because that will no doubt sound very difficult, if not impossible to us, the author gives us an encouraging word about just how we will certainly receive some help, even in the face of adversity. The writer begins in chapter one by reminding us that from our ancestors' very early days, God spoke to us many times through the prophets. But more recently, God has seen fit to send his only son into the world, bringing all the truth and radiance and light of God right into our very midst. Then as we come to today's reading in chapter five, verses five and six, the author tells us that we have already, what we've already heard, that generations earlier, God's plan to send Jesus to come among us was foretold in Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Uh, the author quotes little bits of each of these Psalms. You are my son, today I have begotten you and speaks again about Jesus. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. These days, we're used to thinking of Jesus as God's son. But let's take a look at what our author might mean by referring to King Melchizedek. Most certainly, he's highlighting Jesus' royal and priestly role. In Genesis chapter 14, we encounter King Melchizedek. Here, Melchizedek, whose name means my king is righteous, Melchizedek is described as a priest of God most high. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brings out bread and wine and pronounces a blessing over Abraham. And that, my friends, is about all we know about Melchizedek from the biblical tradition. The author of Hebrews only mentions him briefly here in chapter five and then briefly again in chapter seven, telling us in both places that Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now there are any number of images of Jesus that have captured our imaginations throughout the New Testament. Jesus as a baby, as a carpenter's son, as a shepherd, as a teacher, eating with his followers, even suffering on the cross. But speaking for myself, Jesus as a priest is not really an image that often comes to my mind. But here in chapter five, the author of Hebrews describes Jesus as a priest a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. God appoints Jesus into a priesthood that endures for all time. So just what does that mean? What does it mean that God has appointed Jesus into this priesthood? We should note that the office of the high priest was held in great regard in ancient times. 
We've often understood a priest to be the one who stands between God and God's people. We've understood priests to be mediators or intermediaries. Those who speak to us for God and then in turn bring our speech to God. But I think it might be interesting for us to note that the Latin word for priest, pontifex, means literally bridge maker. And I must say that the concept of a priest as bridge maker creates a rather striking imagery, doesn't it? Standing in a gap sounds mostly passive. And even a mediator who brings messages both to and from God still stands between us and God. But a bridge builder, a bridge builder works to bring two separate entities into continuous and open contact with one another. A bridge facilitates back and forth movement. A bridge stands always at the ready, able to carry either party to the other side. It seems to me that the writer of this letter to the Hebrews not only wanted his audience to understand Jesus as a priest above all others, but the author wanted us as well to understand that Jesus was the priest, the one who would give all of us access to God all the time, in all circumstances, in all places. Connecting the earthly Jesus to the heavenly Christ, showing us the bridge that Jesus built, the writer of Hebrews informs us that during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. In his days on this earth, in the days of his flesh, Jesus prayed with great intensity. And once he ascended into heaven, the writer reveals, Jesus is consequently able for all time to save those who approach God through him. If we were to continue reading in Hebrews until we hit chapter 7, verse 25, we would learn further that Jesus always lives to make intercession for those who trust in him. Being our one perfect High priest, Jesus cries out to God on our behalf. Now, following the tradition of the psalmist, Jesus cries out to the God of our salvation for help, trusting that the one who's able to raise him up in three days can surely also save us. Knowing that Jesus prayed and still prays for us, brings us comfort and reassurance. It helps us to understand that Jesus is with us and Jesus is for us, even while we're experiencing hardship and suffering. Jesus, our great high priest, is the son of the living God, and he submitted himself obediently to God's plan in order to become the source of eternal salvation. We already know that Jesus suffered on our behalf to secure our salvation. But here in this passage, we are also reminded that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Suffering comes simply with living in the flesh. There's no way to escape it, not even for Jesus. And although suffering is never desirable, it's not ever something we would seek out, 
the hardships that we face in this life can help to shape us for better or for worse. This passage helps us to understand that our challenges, whatever they are, should not isolate us, but rather they should lead us into God's presence through the powerful and healing discipline of prayer. So according to our reading today, it's not our suffering itself that teaches us anything. Rather, it is the obedient discipline of turning to God in prayer, which teaches us to trust God more fully, more faithfully. Through prayer, we're called into a deeper, closer relationship with the God of our salvation. We call out to God in prayer, and Jesus, our great high priest, also prays on our behalf. And in that process of our praying and Christ's praying for us, the distance that once separated us from God is bridged. Prayer connects us to God. During this season of Lent, as we anticipate the death of Jesus and also his resurrection, we might do well to spend some quiet time, some moments reflecting on the image of Jesus who prays for us on our behalf. We might do well to spend some time considering this question. When Jesus prays for us, what is the prayer he speaks? And we might do well also to remember that Jesus prays not just for me, but for all of us, for the whole world. We might remember that Jesus not only built a bridge connecting me to God, but that that same bridge is built for others. So the bridge Jesus built connects us to one another and more specifically connects us to every other. None of us, none of us comes to trust in Jesus all on our own. Our faith is established and affirmed and nurtured in community. This is the reality, friends. We all stand on the same bridge. We all share the same great high priest. God, our loving Father, showed his amazing love for the world in this way. He sent his son to bridge what before had been an impossible divide between God and ourselves. For the gift of that bridge, for the relationship it brings us with Almighty God, we give thanks. Amen.
And now, friends, God's beloved, may the light of Christ shine in your hearts and out into the world as well, that God might be glorified and that you might find amazing joy this day and in the days to come, now and forever. Amen.